Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope that you are managing your lockdown well again. It's uh, nice that some of these restrictions have been eased. Uh, in terms of where we are at as a church, uh, because of the numbers and the four square meter rule and the one and a half meter social distancing and our inability still from the Baptist Union uh, to sing songs and uh, we are unable to stand, we have to be seated indoor. We're not quite at the point where we feel we are in a position to open up the church and invite everyone back. Uh, so we're still going to continue with our live streaming for the foreseeable future. Uh, can I assure you we will keep you as updated as we are able to, and we will continue to be uh, discussing this issue and hopefully finding a way when we can get back as soon as possible to church. But for the moment, we're going to continue the way that we are. We are coming to the end of our series in John, believe it or not. This is going to be the last sermon in the Gospel of John after John. Uh, during the holidays, we will have some uh, random sermons, but after the holidays come to an end, we are going to go through the book of Joshua in the evening, and hopefully that will provide some help to you, and uh, it's a very interesting book, and there's lots of different subjects that are covered in the book of Joshua, so you can start preparing yourself for that by reading through the book and uh, discovering the truth in that book for yourselves. This evening we're going to read from John chapter 21, and we're going to read from verses 15 through to verses 25. John chapter 21, verses 15 through to 25. If you would turn with me in your Bibles, whether it's on a phone or whether a Bible like I've got or an iPad or whatever medium you are using, reading from verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you would dress yourself and where you went, you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This is the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that the disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die, but only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father, when we read this encounter that Jesus had with the Apostle John, it's deeply challenging to us. It's deeply informative. We recognize those words that were spoken.
spoken to Peter so long ago are just as relevant today. And you speak those same words to your disciples today. Do you love me? And those words, as they come to us, penetrate into the depths of our soul. And we don't want to answer that too quickly. But we pray that as we read through this passage, as we hear this passage expounded, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, O oh God, that those words would settle down into the depths of our soul. That we would hear your voice to us this evening and hear it very clearly. And we ask that you would give us the ability to have the courage to answer the question that you pose to us. Do you love me? And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. An extraordinary anecdote comes to us from the annals of ancient Mideastern history. As the story goes, Cyrus, the great conqueror of the known world, including Babylon, had a general under his authority whose wife was suspected of treason. She was tried before a great and austere tribunal, found guilty and sentenced to death. After the sentence was pronounced, the woman's husband, a general, made his way to Cyrus's throne and requested, King Cyrus, please, please let me take her place. Cyrus, in awe at what was transpiring before his very eyes, said to his court, can we terminate a love as great as this? He then paroled the woman to her husband. As the couple left the court, the general turned and said to his wife, Did you see the benevolent look in Cyrus's eyes as he pardoned you? The wife responded, I only had eyes for the one who loved me enough that he was willing to die for me. What an incredible story. I only had eyes for the one who was willing to die for me. Jesus Christ died for his people. He died for his church. And the love that was poured out on his church when he died for them is a love beyond our ability to comprehend in all its fullness. And yet, it is that same Jesus who confronts Peter, one of his own, a man who had spent three years with Jesus in close, intimate contact with Jesus, who had confidently asserted prior to Jesus' crucifixion, all of these others, they may desert you, desert you, but me, never, no way, I will lay down my life for you, John thirteen thirty seven. I will go to the nth degree to show my loyalty and my love for you. And when was confronted by the servant in the courtyard where Jesus was being tried, that girl was able to turn away and say, I don't know him, and call down curses on himself. This same Jesus continues to love Peter with the same love he loved prior to his crucifixion. The same love that he had for him even when Peter denied him. Turns to Peter now in the public arena and says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus looks down upon his church, upon his people today. And that question is still the same. Do you love me? And when Jesus asks you that question, what answer do you give? Oh, I know it's very easy for us to so very quickly say, of course, of course we loved you, Jesus. Do you really love him? Or is your love for him 
rather pale in comparison to his love for you? Is your love for him a love that fluctuates, goes up and down depending on your circumstances? Are there times when you feel red hot love for Jesus and other times where you have cold hearted indifference? Or maybe as you watch this particular podcast, maybe as you watch this live stream, you're saying to yourself, I don't love Jesus at all. I've just happened to tune in and I'm listening and and hearing this and yet there is no love for me. Or maybe you're a believer here this evening and you know deep within the recesses of your soul that your love for Jesus is not what it ought to be. And Jesus comes to you again and says, do you love me? Firstly, I want you to notice a barrier to remove, a barrier to remove. Look at these verses, verses 15 to 17. What is the barrier that needs to be removed from Peter? And what is the barrier that needs to be removed from your life for you to love Jesus the way that Jesus asks you to love him? When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, verse 15, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Let's just pause at that first question. You'll notice Jesus changes it slightly in number two and number three. He says to Peter, do you love me more than these? Who are the these to whom Jesus refers? There are three possibilities. We're not going to go through them in any detail, but one possibility is saying, do you love me more than these fishing nets, more than your profession? Or he may be saying, do you love me, Peter, more than you love these other disciples of mine? But that would, in a sense, go against Jesus who has said, love one another as I have loved you. No, when Jesus says, do you love me more than these? He says to Peter, in effect, do you love me more than my other disciples love me? And the way in which Peter answers is incredibly instructive. Because what you're going to see is there is a change that has occurred in Peter. He's not that self-confident, boastful Peter prior to the crucifixion who would have confidently asserted and answered, of course I love you more than these. You should know that, Jesus. But Peter is not prepared to answer like that now. He's learned from his encounters with Jesus. So what does Peter actually say to Jesus? It's really instructive. He says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say to Jesus, you know that I love you more than these other disciples who love you. That's Peter prior to the cross. But Peter post the cross, having been humbled in the sight of Jesus, having recognized and realized his own weaknesses, his own frailties, now all he can say is, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But he won't say that he loves them, loves Jesus more than the other disciples because that is to go beyond what Peter is able to say or can confidently say anymore. All he can say is, Jesus, I love you. And then Jesus repeats the question, although this time he doesn't add more than these. He simply says, Peter, do you love me? And then for a third time, now you might be saying, why is it necessary for Jesus to ask the question again and again? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is because in Peter's public denials of Jesus, there are three denials. And if Peter is going to be restored in relationship with Jesus, Jesus needs to repeat those denials uh, in the form of asking him whether he loves him three times so that at the end of this encounter, in the sight of all the disciples who are present and are observing this encounter between Jesus and Peter, would know with absolute certainty that Peter has been restored by Jesus. 
that Jesus has accepted Peter, that Jesus is not holding this against Peter, that Peter is not some kind of inferior disciple to the rest of the disciples who didn't vocally deny Jesus, even though they fled when the guards came and arrested Jesus. No. And Jesus wants to ensure that as far as all the disciples are concerned, Peter is one of them. Peter has been restored. Jesus has not discarded him. And in that there is such tremendous hope, is there not? Because there are times in our own lives, are there not, where we deny Christ. Oh, we may not deny him verbally, but we deny him in our own minds. We may deny him in our actions. It may be that we are unprepared to stand up for Christ when we are put on the spot, where the pressure is exerted against us and all eyes are focused on us and where we know we should say something, but we're too scared of the recriminations, we're too scared of the response of those who are watching us, too scared of the pressure that's being exerted against us, We don't want to suffer at the hands of them. And so we silently just keep quiet. Oh, we've all experienced that, haven't we? There may be times where we deny Jesus in a temptation that we struggle with. And this temptation comes to us. And we just meekly yield to this temptation. And we deny Jesus' lordship over our lives. Oh, we've all been there. And it may be that we've denied Jesus in that sense more than once. That old repetitive sin that rears its ugly head, that comes and haunts us and causes us so much distress and pain. And every time we yield to that sin, maybe it's a fit of temper, it's anger. Maybe it's a proneness to stretch the truth. Maybe it's our sexual ethics where we're in a relationship with a boy or a girl and we've pushed the sexual boundaries beyond which they should have gone and we've done it again and again and again and each time we come back to God, it feels as though he's going to accept us less and less because it's the same sin. Maybe it's what we view in our, in our viewing life, on our computer, on the TV, or wherever it might be. And, and we know that what we're watching is not what we ought to be watching. Nevertheless, we feel so compelled and so weak that we are unable to resist. And in the process, even though it's not verbal, we're denying Jesus' lordship over our lives. Ah, we've all been there, haven't we? We've all struggled in that sense. Aren't you so deeply grateful that in moments like that, Jesus doesn't just throw you away. He doesn't just cast you aside. But he comes back to you. And he hands out, he he offers his hand and says to you, my dear friend, my dear child, do you love me? And he offers restoration He offers you to come back into fellowship with him. And he offers you to be able to enjoy his company once again. To know the sweetness of that relationship with him. Such is the nature of the wonderful compassion and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what about you who are not saved? You who have heard the gospel again and again and Jesus comes to you over and over and over again and says, my child, turn away from your sin. Come to me. How long will you reject me? Don't put yourself in the position where Jesus finally stops coming to you and approaching you. Repent now, now while there is time. Jesus comes to restore Peter in a public setting because the denial takes place in a public setting. And I want you to also see in this restoration that occurs here that sometimes there have been those in this passage who have tried to contrast the words that Jesus uses. Peter, do you love me? Agapo. 
uh, agape. Peter, and Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you, phileo. And then Jesus says, Peter, do you love me, agape? And Peter says, yes, I love you, phileo. In other words, they try and make this big deal about the contrast between the words that Jesus uses in the original language, saying that the agape love is the love of God and the phileo love is the love of, of, of people between human beings. It's a, it's a wrong point to make because the word phileo for love in the original language and the word agape for love in the original language are used interchangeably in the New Testament. So that God sometimes says, I love phileo, my people. And sometimes the word that is used for love of the world is agape. And so to try and draw that kind of inference out of the different use of the words, it's a complete misunderstanding of the Greek language and a complete misunderstanding of how these words function within the New Testament. Sometimes God uses the word phileo to talk about his love. Sometimes he uses the word agape. So that's not the point that Jesus is making. No, the second reason why he uses th these words three times is because he wants to bring to the surface Peter's inability and Peter's pride and self-sufficiency. He wants to make sure that at that level, Peter is no longer relying on himself, no longer self-confident, no longer brash about his response. In other words, Jesus doesn't want some superficial kind of, yes, Lord, I love you. But he wants Peter to know that when he responds, he responds now in dependence upon him. Now in humility, now bowing at his feet, now saying, Lord, I know once upon a time I was self-sufficient. Once upon a time I was brash, but not anymore, Lord. Not anymore. And so Jesus, for the third time, says, Peter, do you love me? And notice how Peter responds. It's very, very informative. He says, Lord, yes, Lord, uh, you, uh, he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Do you hear what Peter's saying there? He's saying to the Lord Jesus Christ, you know everything about me. Nothing is hidden from your sight. You see into the very depths of my being. So whatever I say, you know the truth. You know that I love you. This is not hidden from you. It's not obscured from you. And I'm willing to rest in your knowledge of me. In other words, Lord Jesus, this is not about me thinking that I've got it all together. This is not about me thinking my love should be at the level at which it ought to be. It may not be at that level. But this much I'm willing to rest in, Lord Jesus, is that you above all else, you know. And that's where I take comfort from. And whatever strength my love is, whether it's a powerful, strong love or whether it's still a weak love, you know that I do love you at whatever level that love is being expressed. Oh, he's a changed man. This is a completely different Peter. His pride has been stripped away. His self-sufficiency is gone, no longer there. And he's in the right position now for Jesus to then turn to him, which we will get to, and say, follow me, follow me. Jesus knows that if Peter is going to serve him, it must be based upon the strength he draws from Jesus and it must flow out of the love he has for Jesus, a genuine love, rather than some superficial verbalization of I love you, but rather a love that is deep within his heart, in the innermost part of his being that Jesus sees. And when Peter is ready at that level, Jesus is able to say, follow me, 
feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, because Peter's ready to do that now. He wasn't prior to that, but now he is. Can I quote from one of the commentators that I think puts it so well? In fact, I'm going to quote from two commentators. By, all, by this time, all of the self-confidence and assertiveness manifest in Peter before the crucifixion of Jesus has drained away. He could only appeal to the Lord's totality of knowledge, which included his knowledge of Peter's heart. He is more than all people could tell that he was speaking the truth. He really did love him. And more than that he could not say. More than that was not necessary. The Lord accepted his protestation of love. Perhaps, another commentator, at long last, Peter has learned that he cannot follow Jesus in his own strength and has realized the hollowness of affirming his own loyalty in a way that relies more on his own power of will than on Jesus' enablement. Significantly, in response to Jesus' new love commandment. Likewise, we should soundly distrust self-serving pledges of loyalty today that betray self-reliance rather than humble awareness of one's own limitations in acting on one's own best intentions. There's a story told about how it's necessary for us to, to get rid of these barriers that may be preventing us from loving Jesus. For Peter, it's self-sufficiency, it's boasting, it's self-confidence. Your barrier may be something different. For this particular returning missionary who took a furlough with her husband and family after an unusual, tiring stint of serving, she happened to live in a house next door to someone who was very difficult. After a few months, some new neighbors that had moved in were giving her lots of problems and they were, in her own words, coarse. There was loud music day and night. And with a constant flow of obscenities, they urinated in front of the yard in broad daylight. They totally disrupted her peace. She could see nothing good in these neighbors of hers. She asked the Lord to help her to be more loving, but all she got back was disgust and rejection. The crisis came when she returned home to discover her neighbor's children had sprayed orange paint all over the beautiful patio that she had decorated. The walls, the floors, everything. She was distraught and furious. She tried to pray but found herself crying out, I cannot love them, I hate them. Knowing she had to deal with the sin in her heart, she began to converse with the Lord and her inner being and the scripture came to mind and beyond all these things put on love, which is perfect bond of unity, Colossians 3.14. In her heart she questioned, Lord, how do I put out love? The only way she could picture it was like putting on a coat, so this is what she determined to do. She chose to wrap herself in the love of God. As a result, she began to experience a deeper life of Christ within her. She made a list of what she would do if she really loved her exasperating neighbors. And then she did what she had listed. She baked cookies. She offered to babysit for free. She invited the mother over for coffee. And the most beautiful thing happened. She began to know and understand them. She began to see that they were living under tremendous pressures. She began to love her enemies, in adverted comments. She did good to them. She lent to them without expecting anything back. Then the day came and they moved and she wept. An unnatural, unconventional love had captured her heart. A supernatural love. A love of Jesus. What's your barrier for her, it was unruly neighbors. What's your barrier preventing you from loving and expressing your love to Christ? Is it your money that you don't want to part with? 
Lord, I love you, but when it comes to this area of giving money, you know, Lord, it's my money and I'm going to spend it the way I want to spend it. Is it your material possessions that you become so in love with? That you spend more time on those things than you spend in devotion to Jesus? Is it your pride? Is it your unwillingness to serve in the church because you're above that kind of service? Lord, I'm not going to clean the church. Let the others do that. Let them give me something more meaningful like leading a Bible study, teaching a discipleship group. But, but cleaning the toilets, Lord, that's, that's someone else's job. That's not my job. Is your love for Jesus perhaps stymied because of your reputation? Lord, I've got this reputation to uphold and if everyone sees me so involved, they're going to think worse of me. Lord, I'm not going to get involved in that ministry because I just don't get on with that person. So, you know, I'd love to be involved, but, but we don't get on, so I'm not going to get involved, Lord. Oh, Lord, you know, you know how much time I, I have available, and there's really no time I have available. I'm, I'm so busy, Lord. Work is so demanding, and I've got so many responsibilities thrust upon me, Lord. I, I, can't, I can't involve myself anymore. I, I can't serve you, Lord, because it's just, just not enough time. And Jesus says, do you love me? Follow me. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Lord, you know, I, I do love you, but, but I, I can't help acting in such an unloving way towards my, my husband or my wife or my children. And Jesus is saying, my friend, sort it out. Don't let that become the barrier between you and I. And our relationship, because God is deeply concerned about how you treat your husband, your wife, your children, or children, your parents. Is that the barrier? That's stopping you from loving Jesus and expressing that love for Jesus? Is it your rebellious nature? Is it saying, Lord, yes, I know I should be doing these things, I, I, but, but, but you know, Lord, I can't help this rebellious nature of mine. Is it your recreational life? Are you so caught up in wanting all your spare time to be your time, your recreational life? Lord, I, I, I want to go fishing. I, I want to play sport. I, I, I want to go to the gym. I, I, I want to go four-wheel driving. I, I, I want to go wherever it is. And, and Lord, I just don't have any time left. Is that the barrier for loving Jesus? Let me ask you a question. When you stand before the master one day, what's really going to count? What's really going to matter? If you love Jesus, and Jesus is saying this to Peter, if you love me, you'll follow me. And if you follow me, you'll serve me. That is the natural outworking of loving Jesus. So what's stopping you? What's your barrier? Will you surrender it to Jesus? And if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship, what barrier is stopping you? Is it your pride? Secondly, I want you to notice a commission to uphold. A commission to uphold. Verses 15 to 17. I'm going to have to move really quickly now, 15 to 17. The commission is, follow me. Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. That is not a call to the pastorate. Hear me carefully. That's not what Peter is being asked by Jesus. No, what Peter is being commissioned by Jesus is saying, Peter, keep on serving the sheep that are mine. Don't give up. Keep on upholding the need to persevere in your service because sometimes the going is going to get rough. 
Peter, don't allow disillusionment. Don't allow opposition. Don't allow frustration in ministry. Don't allow your own feelings of inadequacy to prevent you from continuing to feed my sheep. And that call of feeding my sheep is not just a call specifically to Peter. It is a call that is made to all of Jesus' disciples. All of us must be involved in feeding the sheep. In whatever way God has gifted you, in whatever way God has enabled you, in whatever way God has strengthened you. It's not that we sit back and we expect everyone else to get involved in feeding the sheep as though somehow we are immune. But God wants you to be involved in ensuring that all of his sheep are being looked after and the feeding of the sheep is going to vary from person to person. We are not all gifted the same. We are not all called to be preachers. We are not all called to be Sunday school teachers or Bible study leaders. Some of us are called to be hospitable and offer our homes in hospitality. Some of us are called to be evangelists. Some of us are called to be encouragers, to get alongside people. All of us are called to disciple each other. So in whatever way God has gifted you, in whatever form that gift comes, some of us are called to be musicians and we serve God through the music that we play. Some of us are called to be singers and we serve God through singing. Some of us are called to be greeters at the door where we stand and shake each other's hands. Some of us are being called to serve in the kitchen where we prepare morning tea whenever we get back together and we perform that kind of a service. And in the process, we are feeding God's sheep. Are you upholding your side of the bargain it's not really a bargain is it but are you upholding your side of this core that Jesus says feed my lambs are you exercising your spiritual gifts are you engaged in serving Jesus in some way or is this an area of great embarrassment in your life and this is something He wants Peter to persevere in. That's why he says it three times. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. The repetitive nature of the feed my sheep is a reminder to Peter that he's got to keep on doing this. Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes there's disillusionment. Sometimes the service you render is going to be rejected. Sometimes you're going to go unappreciated. I've experienced it all. Sometimes people are going to oppose you. Sometimes people are going to hurt you deeply. Jesus says, feed my sheep. Don't give up. Keep persevering. Thirdly, there is a cross to carry. Did you see that? A cross to carry, verses 18 to 20. Let me read the verses to you. A cross to carry. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, isn't it interesting? Follow me. In other words, Jesus looks at Peter and he says to him, Peter, your service of me is ultimately going to end in death. This is a cross that you are going to have to bear. Remember what Peter said to Jesus in John chapter 13, verse 37 and 38. He said, I will follow you. I will lay down my life for you. Jesus, in effect, says to Peter, yes, you are going to lay down your life for me. But Peter, it's not going to be on your terms. It's going to be on my terms. I'm the one who's going to determine what that looks like. Now, I want you to think about this just for a moment moment. Reflect on these words coming to Peter. At this point, he's able, he's younger, he's fit, he's vigorous. Jesus says, eventually when you get older, you are going to be frail enough that you are not going to be able to resist those. You are going to be at a point where people are going to help you to have to dress, are going to have to lead you because you are not going to be able to do these things for yourself. But when you reach that point, ultimately what's going to happen, Peter, is you You are going to die for me. Now when he says stretching out of the hands, 
most likely, and I don't want to go through all the options, we don't have time for that, but most likely it is a reference to the fact that his arms are going to be stretched out in crucifixion. What would happen in crucifixion, prior to the person being crucified, they would have to carry the cross beam of the cross and they would carry it to the place of execution. And so the arms being stretched out is that imagery that is being given that he is going to be stretched out not only in carrying the cross beam but also being stretched out in crucifixion. Jesus says in effect to Peter, you are going to die by crucifixion. But it's only going to happen 30 years later. Just ponder that for a moment. Imagine if Jesus came to you today and said to you, this is how you're going to die, but it's going to take 30 years before you get there. You've got this hanging over your head, and every year that passes by, you're one year closer and you may be tempted to start counting down those years. Peter doesn't know it's going to take 30 years. Jesus doesn't tell him it's going to take 30 years. He just says to him, Peter, you're going to be old. And it's estimated that that time period that it took is roughly 30 years. So Peter has to live with this thing hanging over his head the whole time that my life is going to end in martyrdom. But notice also what Jesus says. Through your death, Peter, you will glorify me. That's what matters. There is great comfort and assurance Peter can draw from that, knowing that even though it's going to be a painful, horrible death, and even though he's going to be helpless to prevent it, at the end of the day, that martyrdom he will suffer will bring great glory to God, and that's the only thing that matters. I don't know what your cross is that God is going to call you to bear. I don't know. I know that I've been in ministry long enough to see that it varies from person to person. Sometimes the cross that people have to bear is some kind of physical illness that stays with them all their life and slowly gets worse and worse. Sometimes it's an illness towards the end of their life. Sometimes it's a mental illness that they struggle with. Sometimes it's serving God in particularly difficult places where opposition is, is ongoing. Sometimes it's in a difficult work situation where you just find it so hard and almost oppressive to work there and you're constantly finding people snickering behind your back or giving you a hard time simply because you're a Christian. Sometimes it's a hard marriage that you're in. And the husband or wife that you've got just is so difficult and it's, it's almost an oppressive marriage. For some people it might be the children who are difficult and rebellious and create great heartache and that's the cross that they have to carry. For others it might be an abusive upbringing that they've had to suffer and the scars that are left behind from that upbringing. Maybe that's the cross. It's different for every person. But what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 verse 24 to every follower, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus doesn't promise a life of comfort and ease. Jesus says there's pain to be had if you are going to follow me. Jesus doesn't doesn't pull any punches. And he also says that if we are going to follow him, it may mean that even our close family are going to make life difficult for us. He says, if you really want to follow me, you have to love me more than you love your family. And so if we are going to bow our knee at the foot of the cross, if we are going to hand over our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, then part of the handing over of that life to him involves suffering. You are going to have a cross to carry, whatever that cross may be. And God gives you the right kind of cross for you. There's that wonderful story told of a man who arrives in heaven one day. And as he arrives in heaven, he says to uh, the angel, I don't know why it's Gabriel always welcomes people into heaven, but anyway, that's the way it goes. And he says to Gabriel, how, how, 
how come you gave me such a, a, a big cross to bear? Couldn't you have you given me something small? So the angel Gabriel takes him into a room where there are a whole lot of crosses in this room. Huge ones, small ones, different sizes, different weights. And he turns to this man and he says, tell me, which cross would you like to have in exchange for the cross that you're currently carrying? And this man looks and he says to him in his dream, Lord, Lord the, the, the cross I'd like to have is, is that one, Gabriel, that, that tiny little one at the bottom of the room. And Gabriel says to him, but sir, that is the cross you're carrying. It's different for everyone. And whatever the crosses that you need to bear, do it with gratefulness to God and confidence to know that it's the right cross for you. Fourthly, there is a destiny to accept. Look at verses 21 to 23. A destiny to accept. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Pointing to John. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Now, Peter turns around and sees John following them as they're talking on the beach. And he turns and he points and he says, but what about him? And Jesus effectively says to Peter, Peter, that is none of your business. Move on. It's not your concern as to what is going to happen with John. If I want to, he might remain alive until I return. And then John has to quell any possible rumor that might arise that in fact Jesus is saying he's going to be around when he, when he returns because what happens when John dies? Then the church will become disillusioned and say Jesus was supposed to be returning when, before John died and John is now dead and Jesus hasn't returned. What's going on? And so John adds that little bit in to say that uh, th this rumor that spread is not true. Jesus didn't say he would remain alive, only that he could remain alive if he so chose to want him to remain alive until he returns. But in effect, what uh, Jesus says to Peter is, Peter, don't worry about what I've got in store for John. John is not your concern. Accept your destiny. Accept what is in store for you. Stop being concerned about what may or may not happen to others. Isn't that so often what we're prone to do? We look at others, and we can do this in one of two ways. We can either point to others and say, you know, uh, how, how come they have life so easy? How come they don't have the disasters that happen to me? Uh, how come it, they seem to get away through life relatively unscathed? And I've got all these burdens to bear, and I've got all these difficulties to have to go through, and I've got all these problems that I encounter, and, and yet look at them. I mean, they're no more godly than me. They're no more holy than me. And, and yet they seem to go through life and they don't experience anything like my spirit. Lord, it's unfair. What, a, what about them? And Jesus says, stop worrying about them. Don't concern about yourself about it. It's none of your business. Accept what God has in store for you. Of course, the other danger is, is, is to look at yourself and to say and see others who go through much difficult times. And then in a sense, we can almost say, oh Lord, how come I don't go through difficulties like that? It seems unfair that you burden them and I seem to get through so lightly. And God says, stop worrying about what you do and what you don't experience. It's none of your business about what they experience. That's my business. Get on and accept your lot in life. Rest in my purposes for you. Rest in my will for you. Get on and serve me. And that's why he says to Peter at the end of that, follow me, Peter, just follow me. That's all that you need to be concerned about. Don't look to the left, don't look to, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Stop worrying about what's happening in the lives of others and what my purposes might or might not be for them. You just get on with following me. That's all that matters. And can I say that to you, Christian? Follow Jesus. Don't get caught up in what may or may not be happening to others. And then fifthly, a testimony to embrace. A testimony to embrace. And I'm just going to say one thing. I'm out of time. Verses 24 and 25. What is being said there is G John says all of this about Jesus is true. In other words, dear Christian, when you share your faith, 
you can do it with absolute assurance, absolute confidence, because you know that everything that has been revealed in Scripture is about Jesus Christ is absolutely true. Thus, Paul is able to say in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles, first in point of time. He's not ashamed of the gospel. He knows it's true. He's experienced this reality in his life. Dear Christian, when you are sharing your faith with the unbeliever, don't apologize. Don't become embarrassed. Don't think that this seems all so unreal and they're going to dismiss you and they're going to laugh at you and they're going to mock you. They may do all of those things. It doesn't matter because what you are sharing is true. John makes that point. He's seen it. I've experienced it, he's saying. This is a reality that I haven't made up. I haven't just concocted a story in my mind that seems to be a nice story and then written about it. No, I've observed firsthand all of these things and everything about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, all of it is true. Trust in this truth. Rest in this truth. Rely upon this truth. And to you who is an unbeliever, let me tell you something. If you want real truth, not what the world offers you, which so often is an illusion and fake news, read Scripture. Hear the voice of God to you. Know that this is God's revelation to us and He revealed it through the power of the Holy Spirit who came upon the authors of Scripture and so came upon them that what they recorded is exactly what God wanted recorded. And it's absolutely true from Genesis through to Revelation. And when Jesus calls you and says, repent, turn from your sin, hear those words. Because there's life in Christ and only in him. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. What a wonderful encounter with Peter. As you ask us that question, do you love me? And as we answer that question, help us to do it in humility and help us not to do it too quickly. We pray, O oh God, that like Peter, whenever the end comes, we will be, have found to be faithful. We will still be serving you, still be loving you, still be engaged in growing in our relationship with you. Help us not to falter. Help us not to fall. Help us to remain loyal to the end and help your love for us to grow more and more in us. And Lord Jesus, for those who have not experienced your love, who cannot say with any degree of certainty that they love you, bring them to the point at which they will bow their knee and finally submit all of themselves to you, that they may say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Amen. I have included a couple of songs uh, for you to access. So I trust that those songs will be a little bit helpful. And I trust that you will have a good uh, week that lies ahead. God bless you.